Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. If you look at the website for John Jay College of Criminal Justice, you'll understand why I rave about this remarkable institution. And if you watch some of the videos, you'll see why, without even meeting her, I already love its president, Carol Mason. And she's my guest today. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you for having Thank me. You. It's so wonderful to read it. So it's justice, equity, and fairness. Yes, ma'am. One of the reasons I was attracted to John Jay, I'd worked with them over the years, is because we are educating this generation of students, no matter what their profession is, to, to approach everything with this lens and focus on equity, um, fairness, and, and, and justice. You, you come from directly, and not directly, but you spent a long time at the, ju the Justice Department. Yes. But you also spent a long time in private practice. I did. Right? So I think that's a, 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 a the, the, nice way of calling me old, um, not, which I please, am seasoned. Not old. Seasoned. <laughs> seasoned. Um, right. But I did. I practiced law for 30 years and retired from, from a law firm in Atlanta, but spent eight years at the Department of Justice and the last three and a half years as the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Justice Programs, which is where I became familiar with John yeah. Jay and the wonderful work right. that John Jay does. Well, you know, I... I've worked with John Jay for a long time, and I've been interested in criminal justice for a long time, and especially women in prison, but mm -hmm. um, I've never looked at it the same way that I looked at it this time, because it hadn't been pointed out to me that it's a minority-serving mm -hmm. college and a Latina-serving college. Mm -hmm. I thought that was so interesting. Mm -hmm. What there are, I, I forget now, is it? Uh, 13,000 students? 15,000. 15,000. Right. And a majority, not a majority, not over 57, 50%, but well in the 40s is Hispanic, right? Well, uh, we're at over 50% now. Oh, really? And, and so we're majority minority in, in, in the 75% range. That's so great. It's a, actually more than that. It's a wonderful institution, and one of the things that makes the City University of New York so special, and John Jay in particular, is we are educating um, young people of color who are future leaders. Right. Um, and it's a wonderful place to, to be. I love walking the halls of John Jay and seeing the excitement, the energy, and the passion of our students who are going to be our law enforcement leaders, you know, running our social um, service agencies, our, our, our public service advocates. They're, they're just wonderful. It must be especially good for you because of you being African American. Mm -hmm all your life and a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I like that all my life. And, you know, really mm -hmm. um, pushing it and understanding yeah. kind of the pressures yeah. and everything that's on it. It's terrific. So, not everybody who goes there lands up in criminal justice. Exactly. But they graduate with an understanding that mm -hmm. there is such a thing as mm -hmm. justice in this world, right. Right. which is missing, right? Right. <laughs> well, they grow, so what, what, what they grow up understanding, or not grow up, but they graduate understanding is that we're all citizens, and we all have a responsibility as citizens. We all have a mm. voice and a responsibility as citizens. And so whether they're law enforcement officers or whether they're going to be a probation officer or an artist or a scientist, they approach life with understanding that they have a voice in their communities. They understand their civic responsibility. And it goes well beyond voting. They understand that, that, that they have a voice to hold people who are elected officials accountable. It's such an incredible thing because I, I have always been involved in politics. I was born on Franklin Roosevelt's birthday and I always had this oh. feeling. But it was my seventh grade civics teacher mm -hmm. who really, I think, brought us the message of what it meant to be a member of a community and the yes. responsibilities people have. And I think that's so lacking in most places, right? Right. right. And what's, inter what's interesting about John Jay is many of our students are the first in their families to go to college. Mm. Many are not citizens in the legal sense, mm. but they're all citizens in the sense of this sense of responsibility they have to their communities. And, and I love when you talk to our students, they don't think about I. They don't speak in terms of I. They think in terms of what, what they have an obligation to go back to do, an opportunity to go back to their communities and help those in their communities achieve the American dream. And it's a four-year program with a, with yes. a whole broad uh, mm -hmm. whatever, what, curriculum so, Exactly. Yeah. We have 19 different... Uh, Majors? Around 19 different departments. Um, we have many, many majors, many more than the department. We've got ranging from criminal justice to sociology, psychology, economics. We have an art and music department as well. We have a um, history professor that we know very well, Blanche Cook. Oh, yes. <laughs> Blanche I think Music everybody Cook knows Blanche, right? With her red boots, yes. Right. Uh, tell me, you're, you're very interested in reentry. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, your predecessor mm -hmm. wrote a book about they all come back. Right. And it's a great problem, and we've known that. I've had several guests on who, uh, the justice program from 
uh, Columbia and mm -hmm. um, with, and he cited a study they did in Boston with about, I think it was 125 people mm -hmm. came out of prison mm -hmm. and how many of them went back all because mm -hmm. of the lack of mm -hmm. adequate support from the community, right. Right. Um, education, job right. prospects. It's also unfortunately so connected to poverty, isn't right. it? It Which all makes goes back it the to that. underlying. It all goes back to poverty yeah. and opportunity. So one of the things you know th that I love is there's a lot of research out there. We know what it takes for somebody to exactly. be successful when they leave. Um, the, I, I say love, leave our custody and care of, of, of in, um, yeah. prison system. They, it's education, access to jobs, and connection to family and community. So one of the things that I love that's happening at John Jay is our college. It, it's it's our prison to college pipeline. Well, we have many, many students who are currently incarcerated, but they are our students. We have a wonderful program through our Prisoner Reentry Institute at Otisville Prison, mm -hmm. and I've been there. And um, we have some graduates of John Jay who came to us through that program. And, and I will tell you, going to Otisville and meeting those students there and, and, and hearing their stories and hearing them talk about if they'd had the anthropology class that they were taking and understood how their life circumstances mm -hmm. led them to be there, they wouldn't be there. It's just powerful because they are getting an education because they want it. They're hungry for it, um, and they're inspirational to our students, to our faculty. And seeing one of our students, who I'm not going to name, um, get his, being able to award him his degree in May and seeing what he's doing, it's it's a it's it makes it's, right. Yep. And what I also like to talk about is, in terms of reentry, one of the things that we did when I was at the Department of Justice, when people talk about um, giving people a second chance, though I will argue that many people never had a first chance. But mm -hmm. if the Department of Justice can hire people who were formerly incarcerated, anybody can figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. And we didn't, we didn't change our standards to do it. These are talented, wonderful, talented people that we as a society are missing out on if we don't tap that talent. You have a, a, a whole initiative. I mean, it's a separate mm -hmm. program, isn't it? The Prisoner Reentry Institute? Yes, exactly. And, and I read that there's now money for you to do advise in other college in other uh, facilities. So Ann Jacobs, it, who runs the Prisoner yeah. Reentry Institute, has been very creative in going out and raising money. And we have multiple programs. In addition to the Otisville program, um, we have programs where we connect people who are who have left um, the incarceration to connect them with services so they can go back to college. Anybody who's left our program at Otisville, they're part of our college, part of our program. They may go to Hostos or one of the other CUNY, CUNY schools. Um, and then eventually come to John Jay or one of the other institutions. But it's a program to make sure that they are connected in the community. And one of the things, again, about being at John Jay that's exciting is our Africana Studies Department has partnered with the Prisoner Reentry Institute to create a certification program for people who are coming out of incarceration um, where they will earn co college credit through this program. Oh, yeah. It's just wonderful. You, you also have revised language, mm -hmm. which I think is really important. So let's talk about some of the terms that yeah. we shouldn't use. So you're talking about the op-ed piece that I did. No, uh, I didn't see that. Oh, so no. when I was in my prior job, I wrote a, um, um, I, uh, within the organization, the Office of Justice Program, said that we need to change the language we use. And the reason why I knew to do that is because someone on my team, we, we, we created something called a second chance fellowship. Somebody who'd been formerly incarcerated, who was a lawyer who's phenomenal, Daryl Atkinson, is a phenomenal leader in the formerly incarcerated movement. But he said, we need to be careful about the language we use. And I listened to him and talked with him. And then I wrote a piece for the office that said, we will no, no longer use words like um, felon. Um, we need to use words that think about Inmate. people as human beings. That's the word. Right. I couldn't think of it. Yeah. Um, because I don't use it anymore. Right. I couldn't think of them. <laughs> we talk about people who were formerly incarcerated. You know, you get a, see the humanity and recognize that they're a right. person. They're right. not an objective word. Right. And so um, that's something, you know, student, when I talk about the people who are incarcerated at Otisville Prison who are in our program, I call them John Jay students. Um, and I think it's important how you perceive people and how you people have need the respect. narrative they that need, you use. They need right. respect, mm -hmm. no matter who they are. Exactly. Right? They're still people. I always remember I did a lot of, I do a, or did a lot of work at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility mm -hmm. for Women. And every time I walked in there, I always felt there, but for the grace of God goes I. Because mm -hmm. so many people, mm -hmm. it's just one thing. Right. Because others, as we talked about, it's just inevitable almost from the poverty that we face. Right. But it's funny. And that's what's nice about the, 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 the 
nonpartisan movement that I call it um, across this country, looking at our justice system and really understanding in a more holistic way and understanding that we need to be focused on what kind of educational opportunities, health care opportunities, not just primary health care, mental health care, um, access to jobs that people have so that we're keeping them out of our criminal justice system because you, you hear the stories. We have a program at John Jay um, that was started through our um, Institute for Innovation and Prosecution where prosecutors for the Manhattan DA's yes. office are taking a class with people who are incarcerated yes. at okay. Queensboro Prison. And just to, to hear the stories and see how it changes the perspective of the prosecutors to realize that this is why these people wound up in this situation. One man, I remember the story at the graduation, he'd been released, couldn't find a job, really worked hard to try to find a job, but nobody would hire him. He had a family to take care of, himself to take care of. People make choices because of circumstances. That's why I like to say some people didn't even have a first chance, must let, must yeah. let a second chance. And what other programs do you have? There's some others that you like very much. You called it actually the UN of Justice, oh, yes. right? Yes, yes. I love that. So, so um, do you get lecturers from, like, mm -hmm. I know that um, yeah. Jeremy, that Tra uh, President Travis, or whatever we call him, right. Right. <laughs> that he wrote about German prisons and what yes. goes on there. How right. do you? How do we ever change right. what goes on here? So that was a trip that he took with the Vera Institute. Vera Institute, that Institute yeah. And, and, and um, anyway, so one <laughs> of the things that I think is important, and I, I like to tell this story, that before I got the job at John Jay, I was concerned about the national narrative that um, was beginning to take shape in 2017. And I said, we need to have a convening so that we keep people engaged on what we know about being smart on crime across the political spectrum. So I started planning this convening mm -hmm. before I had a job. Thankfully, <laughs> I got the job at John Jay. So we now have an annual smart on, crime, smart on Crime Innovations convening. And what's fabulous about that is we bring people from across the political perspective, um, people doing all kinds of work to deal with these tough issues in our criminal justice field. And this past year, we dealt with the difficult issues of race. We dealt with the difficult issue that so many people are focused on the reforms on nonviolent offenders. But what about the people who committed violent exactly. crimes? Exactly. You know, we need to, you know, make sure that we provide opportunities for them as well because 90 plus percent of people are coming home. That's the, and we want them right. to be able to be successful. Exactly. And I'm so interested in the violent offenders because mm -hmm. I have a friend who's in prison and has been there for 35 mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. and shouldn't be there anymore, mm -hmm. but she gets turned down. Right. The parole. And the and the data shows that people age out of the right. behavior that caused them right. to become. So what is the point of keeping people incarcerated for so long? It's yeah. Really. Well, that's part of the conversation we need to have is what's our goal? Mm -hmm. You know, when you're in law school, you learn about the, the, the theories of incarceration and why we have it. Um, we've become a How system focused it? on is retribution. It, is it a... That's system, what I think our system has is become Is that what you learn in law school? Well, you learn the three different... Th there's the theory of retribution. There is... Um, rehabilitation and um, um, I always forget what the third one, the, it's a third R, but anyway, yeah. it's, um, but the, the point of it is, is that we need to think about what's our goal? Mm -hmm. and, our, and, and our goal is if, if you're holding people accountable for doing something wrong, why is prison the default? Mm -hmm. There are other ways totally. to hold people accountable without putting them in prison and then there's a, the whole um, field of study about um, young adults, which I learned by coming to convenings at John Jay when I was in mm. the Department of Justice. We know that young people develop differently and that the last thing that develops is impulse, con impulse control. Mm. They can be very smart. Mm. And you know the story some of the developmental psychologists say to people, ask your teenager why they did something and they say, I don't know. They're telling you the truth. They don't know because the, the, the impulse control develops later. So the answer isn't putting them in prison because that, the, the research shows, continues to impede their development. Instead, think about holding them responsible, but in a way that, that supports them being, back, being on the right track and supports them being successful in life. And, and that's what we need to be thinking about as a, as a, in a more holistic way across communities about how do we hold people accountable but, but make an opportunity for them to succeed which is better for all of us and that creates safer communities. So you've spent a lot of time with youth education, youth uh, justice programs. Yes, absolutely. So part of the Office of Justice Programs, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention was part of that. And one of the things we focused on was helping communities 
build partnerships outside of silos so that you have the mm. Departments of Education, Health and Human Services, Social Services working together so we keep them out of the criminal justice system on the front end. And then if they, the former director of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention used to say that, that, that um, youth involvement ought to be rare, fair, and beneficial. No oh, good. Um, and so that if you do have them in your, again, I say custody and care, what are you doing to help them be better when they come out, not worse? And what are you doing even before if exactly. they have a parent who's in prison? You know, I so, mean, I was, we did a lot of work with mm -hmm. domestic violence. And yeah and how all, mm -hmm. so many of these women were in, are in mm -hmm. prison because of mm -hmm. reactions. But it's the same thing, I assume, that you need yeah. the support for these kids. So one of the things that, again, that we've learned um, through research is that connection to family is important, not just for the child to break that cycle, but also for the success right. of the person who's incarcerated. Right. And so that's why we have, um, and I say we have, um, <laughs> my old hat, uh, we funded a lot of programs to support children of incarcerated parents. And you see a win-win. I, I know that these programs that we have now where people who are incarcerated can get work on college degrees, the benefit is when they're talking to their children, their children see their parents studying. getting an education. Mm -hmm. They are, the parents are engaged with telling their children, are you studying, are you in school? So it's a win-win for everybody. But right. that connection, and, and, and one of the things that I had to learn and had to hear from the children whose parents are incarcerated, you know, I, I will admit that I used to think that, you know, if the parent's incarcerated, what kind of influence is that on? A child needs their mom and dad. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what decisions that the parents have made, they're still their mom and dad, and that relationship is important to the to development of the to. child. And we need to keep that healthy relationship and find opportunities for them to work together. Osborne Associates does great work mm -hmm. on that and keeping children and people who are incarcerated connected to their families. There are all kinds of little programs. I mean, I know there's exactly. a program in Brooklyn. That yes. Does it. I, th something came across my computer today about free buses to prison. Mm. It was very oh, interesting. Fabulous. Because you know, a lot of these prisons are far away, mm -hmm. and a lot of the families, yeah. so they have to get the yeah. buses, and it was, mm -hmm. uh, they used to get yeah. on the buses at Columbus Circle. Oh. So you'd come yeah. down, actually, my husband wrote a comma about, mm -hmm. you'd come down from Lincoln Center and all the splendor yeah. of Lincoln Center, yeah. and you see these lines yeah. of women lined up with yeah. babies to get on the yeah. bus to go yeah. travel way up to. And the challenge is even harder with women who are in prison because who are the mothers? Because, because the fathers, there aren't as many right. of them. And so they're, for, you know, most prison systems try to locate people closer to their mm -hmm. families so they can maintain that relationship. But for women, there aren't that many facilities. So, right? so they're further away from their kids and how do you keep them connected? And a lot of them, unfortunately, are single women right. mothers. Right. And there isn't somebody bringing them up. It doesn't, right. the visiting isn't the same, is it? Right, yeah. it's hard. Yeah. So what do you think the future is gonna be? I mean, should we mm -hmm. resent, I can't help but feel a little resentment with conservatives supporting mm -hmm. <laughs> justice reform. I know it's terrible. Mm -hmm. Because their bottom line is the money that's being spent. Right? But you know, is that I, changing a little bit? Well, I, um, my view is whatever brings people to the table to want to solve the problem, right. Let them I'm come. all for it. <laughs> and people come to the table for lots of different reasons. Um, but once they're there, I, I think they see the importance of the work, no matter what it was that brought them there, whether it was the fiscal issues or whether the moral issue or whether, you know, just the fairness issue. But, but to have people in conversation, and that's the beauty of where we are right now. You, you were asking uh, about what do I think. Mm. I am hopeful because people are having conversation and dialogue that, that are non-traditional partners in this work. I am hopeful because when I walk the halls at John Jay and I see these students who are in class together, whether they're going into um, law enforcement or they're going to go into social advocacy, they're learning together. And I am hopeful because that's the generation that's approaching this work with a different perspective. And it's not a, a us versus them, it's a we. And that's what we're trying to do. And you talked about you know earlier about John Jay being the United Nations. Um, the Secretary of State for New York coined that phrase. She said, John Jay is the United Nations of criminal justice issues. This is the place where we could teach people how to have those difficult conversations. I was talking with our provost this morning about that, that, that what's hard sometimes is to get people to, to raise their voice when something's difficult to say or when they feel like they, that, mm -hmm. that, 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 that something is not fair to them. You know, we're, we're giving them the tools and the voice to speak up and say, we need to have a conversation about this. This is how I'm experiencing this. 
and, and talk about it. And that's why I'm more confident about what kind of world we'll have because I think this next generation will be better at it than, than ours and having those tough conversations. And you can, and it's the, the professions, not only is it, it not only tugs on your conscience and your soul, mm -hmm. but it's also, unfortunately, I guess, an everlasting thing that we have to deal with. I mean, it, for jobs and future. You mean if people have something criminal justice related on their I, record? Yeah. I'm a little in inarticulate. But. No, 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 I just want to make sure I was understanding the question. You're quite articulate. Um, I think that, that um, again, I'm somebody that's always going to see the, the what ifs mm -hmm. and the possibilities mm -hmm. and not get discouraged. And I think that we see a new movement now mm -hmm. where people are saying that putting that on your application, it's not relevant to your ability to do the job. Mm -hmm. And so we'd make great progress with what we call ban the box or beyond the box right. in the That's education right. setting. No and, right. and I'm hopeful that, again, uh, there's so many educational institutions that are doing this work of, of, of seeing the importance of educating people who have criminal justice involvement. Um, and and then employers. I mean, some you know the employers that that we honored when I was in the administration for Champions of Change. Um, they say their best employees are those who had a prior criminal history and were given the opportunity to work, and they 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 appreciated that opportunity. And some of the best employers employees they've ever had. Well, it, and we see it in drug treatment and yeah. all kinds of things. It's yeah. the having that experience, mm -hmm. and it's so. Um, I was looking through the catalog, and I have a daughter who's graduating from college, and she's a psych major. And I said, now you've got to look at John Jay, because the graduate program, I mean, mm -hmm. I said you could do forensic psychology, right. you could go to law school, right. whether you're at the same, can you do it at the same time? It's so, a connection with CUNY Law School. Um, there are a lot of joint degree programs. I'm new enough that I'm not okay. well versed in what, right. what they are, but, um, but we do have a wonderful um, psycho forensic psychology program. We have a wonderful PhD in psychology program. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that what's interesting is watching young people today, regardless of whether we have the, the institutional structures in place, mm -hmm. they go create them so she can make it happen. I also met a city councilwoman, a, pers a candidate for city council, mm -hmm. for mayor of Phoenix yesterday, mm -hmm. and she was talking about the importance of the community police relationship. Mm -hmm. And I said, you have to look at John Jay right. <laughs> for advice and stuff. You consult with other organizations, other communities, right? We do. So um, <laughs> there's this nice alignment of my prior job and this current job. I think it was um, preordained. Um, but so one of the things that um, John Jay, when Jeremy was the president of John Jay, that he brought to my attention was this need to build trust between law enforcement and communities of color. So I stopped talking to him. Um, put together a uh, request for a proposal, and we ended up, uh, I cobbled together money to fund something called the Building Community Trust Initiative. Mm -hmm. And what it did was it took, we knew that there was good research on procedural justice, we knew there was great research on racial reconciliation, and on implicit bias. And the winning proposal happened to be based at John Jay. Great. So I got to st see the start of that, and actually in a couple of weeks, in March, we're going to have the culmination of that work of building, building those, the, that trust relationship between law enforcement, using all three of those pillars that we know from research works. And, but but we, what we had never done was pulled them all together. together. So uh, the National Network for Building Safe Communities at John Jay in the form of David Kennedy is the place to come if you want to have conversations about how to deal to, with those issues. Yeah. Are you, do you work with the police academy? Um, so you mean the NYPD police mm. academy? In, in a couple of different ways, not the academy directly. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, uh, I think that we are probably um, uh, have more John Jay alums in NYPD than any other school in the country, mm -hmm. including the um, commissioner himself, his two John Jay degrees. Um, <laughs> so we have a couple of programs. A lot of, a lot of um, NYPD officers come to John Jay before they qualified to enter the NYPD. I know, I see have, them walking, because mm -hmm. I live near there, yeah. and I see them walking west to east in their gray uniforms, right? No, that's the Department of oh. Correction, and we oh, have a program oh. with them okay. as well. Oh, good. Um, but, the, um, but we have the Apple Corps, where it's a two-year program. That they're they're going to get their four-year degree, but for two mm -hmm. years, they're in this intensive program that's designed to introduce them to NYPD and hopefully get them into the NYPD Police um, mm -hmm. uh, Cadet Corps. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we also have a wonderful partnership with NYPD where we take their future leaders and we just graduated our first master's class um, where they get a master's of criminal justice and one of the graduates right after graduation got a promotion um, so to a leadership yeah. position. So there's a great partnership with NYPD. So you can, uh, we're now finished with our half okay. hour. But I wanted to say we can see why the website and the institution are so enticing yes. and people should really look at it mm -hmm. and support it, but also to understand uh, for kids and students mm -hmm. what a future they were going to get. I hope they will. And I think I they're they lucky will. to have you with all your passion and commitment. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you for so having much. me. This thank has you, been a wonderful thank conversation. You. Thank you.